This video presentation is on the philosophy of the late Warring States period philosopher Han Feitza. The great historian of Chinese philosophy, A.C. Graham, refers to a period during the Han Dynasty of a school of, skin, of syncretetic philosophy. Syncretetic here refers to a kind of amalgamation of philosophers, a combining of elements from various schools of thought. The schools of, of Chinese thought until the Han Dynasty had not been categorized. We get some of the ways in which the Han doxographers characterized schools of thought from the important term section in the RCCC in the RCCP. To begin with, there is a recognition that the Warring States period is very productive of different philosophies. We find in the important terms section a description of the so-called hundred schools. It is under the heading Bai Jia. A collective name for the various schools of thought that proliferated during the late spring and autumn and warring states periods. The notion of a school of thought in early Chinese philosophy is quite loose. Only rarely does it only rarely does it describe a set of thinkers who shared fundamental beliefs or doctrines. More often, it is a concept applied retrospectively to identify groups of thinkers who shared common themes or approaches, or who studied with or were inspired by a common thinker. The Han doxographers specified Confucianism, and this is also from the RCCP in the important term section. Ru, traditionally translated as Confucian, this term has no etymological relation with the name Kongza, Confucius. The term appears to have been in use prior to the time of Kongza, but there is considerable scholarly debate over exactly what its original meaning was. After Kongza, however, it clearly is used to refer to those who think of themselves as carrying on a tradition of culture and learning that Kongza defended and came to represent. However, the erudites often disagreed vehemently among themselves about how to interpret this tradition. The RCCP also um, follows the Han doxographers in specifying the Moists. Mojia, Moa school or Moism, the school of thought that grew around and out of the readings, the teachings of Moza. They also, the Han doxographers also specified the Taoists. Daojia, a term applied retrospectively in the Han dynasty to a varied collection of thinkers, especially Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, who rejected both the particular conceptions of ethical cultivation of the erudites and the rationalistic consequentialism of the Moists. And the school of names, Mingjia, school of names, a term applied retrospectively in the Han dynasty to a varied collection of thinkers who shared a common interest in the nature of language, debate, and paradox, including Gong Sunlong and Hui Tzu. Before the advent of the Han Dynasty, however, Han Feitza makes reference to some of the major schools of thought of his day in chapter 50. He only identifies two of them, however, Confucianism and Moism. Elsewhere, though, he considers together ideas from thinkers that the later Han doxographers would classify as legalists. Moreover, Han Feitza writes a very sophisticated commentary on the Tao Da Jing, attributed to Lao Tzu. More than other thinkers of the classical period, Han Feitza seems to have a preliminary doxographical understanding of the philosophy of the time period. Han Feitza himself is usually, has usually been placed in the legalist school of thought. In some ways, this isn't an accurate placement. 
Yet a different way of looking at Han Fates, I believe, opens up new avenues for understanding his work. Not only is he a preliminary doxographer, but he takes aspects from various schools of thought and studies and integrates them into his own philosophy. He can then be thought of as a, pre, uh, a precursor to the Han syncretistic, syncretistic thinkers. Legend has it that Han Feita studied under the Confucian philosopher Shunza alongside the person who would prove to be his ultimate nems, uh, nemesis, Lisa. While in his own writings, Han Feitza rejects the Confucian idea that the way to achieve political order is by instill, instilling goodness, we can find places where he advocates filial piety, for instance, in which he sounds quite like a conventional Confucian. One of the central points of his philosophy is a thoroughgoing consequentialism, and this brings his philosophy into proximity with the Moists. Not only does he write the first commentary on the Tao Te Ching, he also frequently makes the language of Taoism takes on and invokes the language of Taoism in the expression of his philosophy. And then there are his roots in legalism. Let's look at the description of legalism that we get in the important terms section of the RCCP text. Fadya, legalist school or legalism, a term applied retrospectively in the Han Dynasty to the intellectual movement centered on the writings of Gong Sun Yang, Lord Shang, Shen Dao, Shen Buhai, and others that took an amoral approach to the problems of social and social and political organization and management. There are a couple of things that should be said about this description. First, the name itself, legalism, invokes an idea about the preeminence of law that does not actually make it into the description, into that description of legalism. We will have to say something about that. Second, what does get emphasized is an aspect of this school that probably should be characterized as political realism. One of the principal articulations of political realism in the West comes from the Florentine philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli. Political result realists are those thinkers and political operatives who believe that to succeed in politics, one must accept the, the practices and institutions as they actually are, rather than invoking, no, invoking moralistic ideals. Here's how Machiavelli famously put it in chapter 15 of his political masterpiece, The Prince. Now there remains to be examined what should be the methods and procedures of a prince in dealing with his subjects and friends. And because I know that many have written about this, I am afraid that by writing about it again, I shall be thought of as presumptuous, since in discussing this material, I depart radically from the procedures of others. But since my intention is to write something useful for anyone who understands it, it seemed more suitable to me to search after the effectual truth of the matter rather than the imagined one. And many writers have imagined for themselves republics and principalities that have never been seen before nor known to exist in reality. For there is such a gap between how one lives and how one ought to live that anyone who abandons what is done for what ought to be done learns his ruin rather than his preservation. For a man who wishes to make a vocation of being good at all times will come to ruin among so many who are not good. Hence, it is necessary for a prince who wishes to maintain his position to learn how not to be good and to use this knowledge or not use it according to necessity. Machiavelli goes on to say in chapter 18 of The Prince, a chapter entitled 
how a prince should keep his word, that a prince must learn to act according to laws, which is the way, which is a way proper to, to man, but must also learn to act with force, which is the way of beasts. In particular, a prince must learn the ways of the lion and the fox. The lion, he says, cannot defend himself from traps, and the fox cannot protect, protect itself from wolves. If the prince takes both natures, though, he will be all right. The fox recognizes traps, and the lion scares off the wolves. Obviously, the Confucians and the Moists and even the Taoists belong to the class of thinkers who Machiavelli derides as imagining states that could not possibly exist in reality. Parenthetically, though, let us not forget that there is a realistic aspect in parts of the Tao Te Ching, and we'll discuss in a moment whether or not that is also true of Confucianism. In any case, they are political idealists. They seek to make politics conform to a moral ideal. The legalists are aligned with Machiavelli. This confrontation between political idealism and political realism continues to pit Confucians and legalists in China even to this day. Still, there is often a grudging acknowledgement that the other side has a point. In his important contribution to contemporary political theory that seeks to offer Confucianism as a modern tonic to the dominating worldview of liberalism, Joseph Chan acknowledges that Confucian idealism must be tempered with realism. In the opening sentence of his book, Confucian Perfectionism, A Political Philosophy for Modern Times, he says, quote, this book examines Confucian political thought from a perspective that explores the intricate interplay between political ideal and reality. Doing so, he says, necessitates lowering the sights and revising the content. Yet his way of adding realism involves embracing the realism found within Confucianism itself in the Grand Unity and the Small Tranquility chapter of the Li Ji. Recall this discussion in the video presentation that we have of the Li Qi. As for legalism proper, Chang gives it no place in his program. And in fact, he uses it as a cautionary, cautionary position that shows how our, our ideals may be warped. Somewhat contrary to Chan, another recent writer, Lubna El Amin, writes, my argument in this book is that the approach to politics offered by the classical Confucian texts does not follow from Confucian ethics in any straightforward manner. She continues that for Confucians, the standard of politics is therefore not virtue, the moral edification of the people, but rather the establishment, the establishment and maintenance of political order. On Ella, a means account, then, Confucianism itself comes quite close to um, having realistic elements. El Amin's interpretation is one in which the Confucians are far more willing to embrace political realism than has generally been acknowledged. The debate over idealism versus realism and the respective places of Confucianism and legalism is still very much alive in discussions about contemporary political theory that has been influenced by classical Chinese philosophy. As for Han Feitze himself, he is clearly a realist, but he is also a legalist who emphasizes the importance of the place of law. The two features are presented in an interesting way in chapter 43, which is entitled in our RCCP text, as deciding between two models of government. In this chapter, Han Feitze embraces both the ideas of Shen Buhai and Gong Sun Yang. Here is what he says on page 335 of our text. A questioner asks, 
Shan Buhai and Gong Sun Yang.